possible. I want to read our scripture this morning. So if you would, go ahead and stand up as we read God's word together. We're going to start in Philippians chapter 3. We're continuing our series through the book of Philippians. Uh, We kind of put that on hold last week to do something that was, I believe, really important. But we're going to continue into chapter 3 this week. And we'll finish up in chapter 4 next week. It starts chapter 3 and verse 12 of the book of Philippians. By the way, Paul, he's quarantined under house arrest for two years as he's writing this book. So he understands and is living through a very similar experience, except he's chained to a guard and can't leave his house at all. And and so uh, as we're in our quarantine situation, of course, our phases are kind of coming out and we haven't been there, but three, four months, he was there for two years. And so uh, that's where he's speaking from. Let's keep that in mind as we read. He says... Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and straining, straining towards what's ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You may be seated. I press on. I, I like that, that phrasing. Well, I say I, I like it. It's kind of a tough phrasing, isn't it? Uh, straining for what's ahead. Like I'm, I'm not just reaching for what's ahead. I'm not just heading towards what's in front of me. I'm straining. It, it, it's this struggle within Paul to reach towards what's next for him. Uh, what I want to talk to you about for a little bit is, is one word, and it's perseverance. And, and perseverance is a, it, it's a tough thing, isn't it? It's an understatement. Let me start with this. Have, have you ever run out of gas before when you're driving? Let me see a show of hands for those of you that ran out of gas on the side of the road. All right. So I've been a part of two experiences where one, we almost ran out, and another where we did run out. And both were humorous and kind of miserable. And uh, I'll share one of them, one of the two with you. Uh, one, I, I'm riding with my buddy. Uh, this is... I guess I'm early high school age, and, and he's, you know, kind of a senior, so he's the older one. So we're riding in his truck, and he's taking us around, and he had forgotten to get gas. And so we're driving into town, and as we're pulling into town, his truck just starts to give. And he says, oh, it's going. <laughs> it's going. And we start sputtering, you know, and all of a sudden, you just, nothing. So he clicks it up into neutral and had enough momentum to pull us into a, a little business on the side of the road, into a parking lot perfectly, and stop the car right there. But now we're trapped, and so we have to wait for like an hour and a half for his grandma to come bring us some gas from her house, you know. Uh, and, and it was hot and, and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, we made it through. But being out of gas, uh, it's not a fun experience. I'm sure you've got a lot worse experiences than just being able to, you know, it's pretty convenient for us. We did pull into a parking spot, you know. Um, I'm seeing some smiles out there. So I know there's some stories that I would love to hear at some point. But, but being out of gas, man, that's a, that's a tough thing. I, I don't know how many of you are sports fans where you like to watch sports. Let me see your hands. All right, so we got a lot of sports fans. If you watch sports, there's a phrase that they use. I'm sure it's used in other places. This is where I hear it the most. And I want to share with those of you who aren't sports fans so that you know, there's a phrase where when somebody's really tired, we call it what? They're out of gas. They're gassed, right? And so you'll hear that phrase. It, it's, and, and the idea on that is I've got no energy left to keep going. I've got no momentum left. I, I've given everything I've got. Coach, i got to get some Gatorade. You know what I'm saying? You ever felt that in your spiritual life where you're just out of gas? You know what I'm saying? You ever been gassed emotionally, physically? Like, because this is not just a, a problem um, outside of our minds. Man. In our minds and our hearts, we can become gassed. We can run out. And it's a miserable experience. I've been there before. 
I've been there multiple times. Actually, uh, ministers, we're not uh, excused from that, are we? And, and we, I know you've, and, and Alan, like we, we've talked, and Daryl, I don't know if Daryl's here this week, he's probably watching. I mean, we've had probably classes and read books on ministry burnout. It's a real thing. I took a class on this at preaching school. It was a, a class specifically to handle burnout in ministry. That's why your elders have, have given, I think, what is it? Was it seven years for a sabbatical? It's to help with something called burnout. It's a real thing. And so when a minister's been here seven years, they get a one-month sabbatical to go in to reflect and to take time. And, of course, some ministers are like, I don't want to go. You're, it's forced because we want to make sure that we're protecting you from something that's very, very real. And it's called burnout. And it's not just for ministers. It's not just for ministers. You felt it. But you ever hit a point where you just want to quit? I have. I, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I can't be this rock for my family. I, I can't keep being the one to go and to be that strong point for them. I, I can't be uh, the person that they need me to be. I can't be what they're asking me to be at work. I can't do this with school anymore. I can't keep this mask on anymore and act like everything. I'm done. I'm gassed. I'm out. I quit. I can't. You ever hit that point? And then your prayer life becomes... God, you got to get me out of this. God, please, I can't do this anymore. You say that you won't let me be tempted beyond what I can bear. You won't let me crumble, but God, I'm crumbling and I'm done. And I can't do this anymore. And I know that people are depending on me. I know that it may be family and people that I love that are depending on me, but I, I, can't, I can't do this anymore. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because some of you are there right now. So for those of you who have felt that, prayed that, thought that, experienced the turmoil on the inside of being out of gas uh, and, and tried to search for answers. By the way, I, I've searched for a lot of answers because when your tank is empty, you're, you're with my metaphor here, spiritually on the inside. Uh, when your tank is empty and you're out of gas, there's a lot of things out there in the world that they'll try to tell you to fill your tank with. The world will say, well, if you're tired and if you you have nothing left, then just try this. And, and, and people, we buy into that because we get to a place where we're so desperate to find any relief from what we're feeling with being out of gas on the inside that I'll try anything. And then sometimes you get hooked to things that you didn't want to get hooked to because you were trying to find relief for something that only Jesus can fill. But we didn't know that answer at the time. And now I'm addicted or I'm stuck and I've lost momentum because I bought into the lie of the world that this would fill my tank. Um, you know, Jonah... Uh, some of us, you know, you run out of gas. How, how crazy would it be if, like, you're, you're almost on empty? You've, you've got, you know, no gas left. The, the, the truck is kind of sputtering, you know, and, and you're on an interstate. Nobody's around, but you go ahead and you just stop and pull over the car on the side of the road and you turn it off. So you don't run out of gas. I'm, I'm not out of gas. I still I got a little bit left. I mean, and then you sit back in your vehicle the next day and you're going to turn it on and what's going to happen? You're still in the same place that you were, but somehow you feel better because you turned the truck off for a little bit. Some of us try to find escapes from reality of the problems that we're facing because I can't do this. I can't deal with this stress anymore. So I'm just going to go, I'm going to go shut down the rest of the world and I'm going to watch TV and I'm going to play this video game or I'm going to drink this alcohol or I'm going to go and do this and be with these people and act like the problems in my life and the burnout that I'm experiencing in my spiritual soul is not there but what's going to happen is you're going to wake up the next day and be in the same situation what do we do when we're facing burnout in our spiritual souls because it's a real thing you know jonah uh just for an example of somebody that that buys into and tries to deny the fact that he is where he is you remember what's going on he's fleeing from god and he runs the other way and he gets on the boat with all the sailors and then god brings a storm on the sea and the boat's ripping apart because this storm is so intense and all the sailors whose job it is i mean it's their professional job to work ships, to be in the midst. They've been in storms before. They're terrified. They're praying out to any God. They, they're, they're praying out to whoever they can find. And they're throwing things overboard. And the ship's breaking up. And where's Jonah? Anybody remember? He's sleeping. 
Now, how, Jonah, how can you sleep in the middle of a storm? And, and, and does Jonah know why the storm's there? Absolutely. It's my fault. It's because I'm running away from God. And did he know that God was going to find him? Jonah's not... It, it, now, Jonah was... Um, I, I can't figure out a better way. Jonah was an idiot. Okay? But at the same time, Jonah wasn't foolish. He wasn't ignorant. He wasn't stupid. He knew the Lord. Actually, when you get to chapter 4, he says, that's the reason I didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place, because I knew you were so loving that you would forgive them. And so Jonah knew what was going on, and yet he knew that the Lord would find him. He knows who God is. He knows his heart. He knows his power, but he goes to sleep as if his problems are just going to go away when he wakes up. And yet we do the same thing when we're on low, we're on empty, we're out of gas, and we just try to avoid the problem, whether it's through a bottle, whether it's through drugs, whether it's through other relationships that we shouldn't have with this woman or this man. And, and, and we, we find ourselves in a situation where we're avoiding the real problem and we don't know where to find the solution. So what do we do when we face burnout? Well, first thing I want you to know is that you're not alone when you feel at that wit's end moment and you say, I can't do this anymore. Okay, I got some great men of faith that I thought of. I uh, thought of a lot more, but I'll, I'm only putting two down. One is Elijah. You remember Elijah, he goes and, and of course they have, uh, he's on the mountain and, and it's the battle of the gods, you know, and it's Baal versus God. And, and, and God shows up and does these wondrous miracles and he destroys all the prophets of Baal. And, and man, it was a victorious <laughs> moment. And right after this, Elijah goes and, and Jezebel's coming after him. And, and, and now, Elijah knows God's been with me. He's protected me through these prophets. He's protected me through this in, in, insane, awesome moment. You need to go back and, and read that in 1 Kings. It's a really cool story. And yet now, Jezebel's coming after him. And now he's scared. God can save me from Ahab, and he can save me from all these false prophets. But now that Jezebel's coming after me, I'm scared. And he gets so scared that he runs off to the desert, finds a tree and sits under it and prays for God to kill him and, and die so that he can die in a more peaceful way than at the hands of Jezebel. Now, how in the world could Elijah go from the chapter before fighting the prophets of Baal to the next chapter sitting in the desert under a tree? And what I believe is it was burnout. I think Elijah was saying, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I, I can't keep being the voice of God. And actually, as you read uh, later in that, that, that chapter, you realize Elijah said, I'm the only prophet left. I'm the only one. And God reminds him, no, you're not. I'm raising up 7,000 more. But Elijah feels like he's alone. He feels like he can't do it. So he goes out under this tree to die. And an angel comes to him and, and, and strengthens him and provides food and water and says, get up and eat. And, and, and in other words, keep going, Elijah. Don't stop. And Elijah eats and he drinks and then he lays back down and goes back to sleep again. And so the angel has to come back a second time, give him more food, give him more drink. And he wakes up and he eats and he drinks and he's strengthened. And finally he goes. But then where does he go? He goes up to a mountain and into a cave and he hides. This is that famous moment with Elijah where he runs to the cave in the mountain and he hides. And it's the, uh, when you think about depression in scripture, this is that moment where Elijah is just so depressed. He's, look, he's out of gas. He, he's done. He's burnt out. And so he hides in the back of this cave. And God comes not in the earthquakes and the fire, but he comes in the still small voice and encourages him and reminds him to keep going. And from that moment, through the presence of God, Elijah is encouraged enough to go and find in the next chapter. He finds Elisha, makes him his follower. And from that moment on, they go and begin to set a course to change the history of Israel forever and lead God's people. I mean, it's an awesome story, but it, it, uh, in the middle of it, we can relate. Elijah says, I'm done. I, 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 I give up, God. I surrender. Peter, remember Peter, he, he's in, in Matthew, Jesus comes to him. And, and the first time that Jesus comes to Peter, what's Peter doing? He's fishing. You remember that? And Jesus says, cast your net on the other side and they catch a bunch. And then he comes in, he says, hey, no, you're not going to fish for fish anymore. You're going to be fishers of men. And Peter begins to follow Jesus and he follows him all the way through his ministry. Peter wasn't always perfect, but he was always there, right? 
But then he has this moment where I think he's just, his tank's on empty and he's burnt out. He's just denied Jesus three times and, and, and he's failed. And he looks at himself and he says, I'm a failure. And on his spiritual, on the inside, we relate, don't we? On the inside, he says, I can't be this anymore. Who am I kidding? Trying to act like I'm a person of faith. I'm not a person of faith. Look at my life. Look at the things I do when I get home and I'm by myself and nobody else is around. Look at who I am. I'm a wretched man. That's what Paul says. Oh, what a wretched man that I am. Peter says, I can't be this anymore. This disciple, this apostle. That's not me. Who am I kidding? And then he says this phrase at the end of John. And he says, I'm going fishing. Not fishing for men. I'm going fishing for fish. I'm going back to who I was because I'm done. I can't be this anymore. I can't do this anymore. I'm going fishing. What, what's going on, Peter? He's burnt out. He's done. He says, I quit. And of course, then Jesus comes in and begins to talk to him, the resurrected Lord, and has to remind him through the three I love you's, which were like directly to the three denials. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then Peter begins to be recharged. And he goes on to be in Acts chapter 2 right after that scene. Now he has the momentum to preach the first gospel sermon. And to be the one to open the door of the gospel to the Gentiles in, in Acts 10. Like that's all through Peter. But Peter had to make it through and persevere through his burnout moment. And in order for you to achieve the greatness that God wants for you, then I'm challenging you to understand that the same message is true for you. In order for you to achieve and to become who God wants you to become, you're going to have to push through your burnout moment. You're going to have to find the strength to get a little more gas, to put a little Gatorade in the, in the body, to keep on going, to keep on trying, to keep on persevering to make it. Paul says, I strain towards what's ahead. I press on. I persevere. And that's what he's calling us to do. But here's the question. That's great. You're not alone. But what do I do about it? Well, how do you persevere? How do you make it through? The first thing is you have to renew your mind. I've got two things very quickly. First is you renew your mind. And, and, and renewing your mind is something that, I, well, I haven't understood my whole life. I'm still learning what that means. But here's what I used to think renewing your mind meant. Um, how many of you love to do crossword puzzles? Any crossword puzzles out there? A few of you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I love to look at them <laughs> over Avery's shoulder and see if there's any sports questions. Because I can probably get two, cross, or two answers per crossword. Uh, we're doing the Sunday crossword. We've gotten the Sunday paper. We were actually sitting together doing it this morning a little bit. I only got like two answers, and they were both sports related. It's horrible. And she's like filling out half the thing by herself. Anyway, and, and so, uh, but what I remember about crosswords is my memo, and uh, my grandma was watching this morning. It's not my grandma, it's my memo, it's on my dad's side. And, uh, but my memo used to always do those crosswords. That's like one of the images that I have of her uh, before she passed away was always walking in and seeing her do these crossword searches and, and she would always tell me Nathan you need to do these too and I would sit in her lap and act like I'm doing it and I wouldn't do it you know because I was really young and uh, of course now that I'm old I couldn't do it either and uh, and she would tell me these are healthy for you they're good for your brain she, and, she, and then she'd say this weird phrase she'd say it make your brain all wrinkly <laughs> You know, and, and, and it's true, by the way. I mean, there's studies out there that show that doing puzzles and things like that, it is healthy for your brain. So that's a good thing. I'm not saying it's not. But I always thought, like, if I want to be smarter, then I have to be good at these crossword puzzles. And it's, look, it's a fail for me, right? Like, I'm out of luck if that's the way that your brain is, is renewed, that you renew your mind. And then I realized that Scripture says there's something else that we can do to help train our brain and strengthen our brain and strengthen our minds and hearts. And when we're on empty and we have nothing left and we say we want to quit, there's another way than just doing some crosswords. And it's called renew your mind, Paul says. And, and, and that, that's this idea of meditating on Jesus. It's the idea of praying to him. It's having a relationship with the Almighty that renews you and gives you something that you can't find anywhere else. You'll never find it in the bottle. You'll never find it in that relationship. You'll never find it in the pornography. You'll never find it in, in the drugs. You're never going to find it anywhere else outside of Jesus. He's what you're looking for. You just don't know it yet. He's the answer to the burnout that you're feeling. 
And I promise you, I promise you, you, you ask the people who have been faithful for a long time. There's several people in here. You've already pushed through your burnout moment. You've had those moments where you said, I can't be this anymore. I can't do this anymore. You've had that experience. So find someone who's had that experience and ask them, how did you make it through? And they'll tell you, every one of them. I don't know who you are. I don't know what your burnout experience is, is, but if you made it through, it was through the grace of God. It was through the relationship with Jesus that pushed you to keep going. And the same is true for all of us in the midst of our next burnout. Because here's the problem. It's going to come again. But hopefully we've learned the answer to the burnout. Listen, when, when Elijah is in the mountain and he's burnt out and he's, he's been in the desert and he says, I quit, I'm, I, I want to die, God. What does God do? Leave him there? No, he sends an angel to give him strength. What does he do when he's in the mountain? He comes in the still small voice. When we're at our low points and we're burnt out and we have no gas, God says, I'm coming. And through his presence, we find strength. When Peter said, I'm going fishing, I can't be who you want me to be anymore. What happens? Jesus, the resurrected Lord, appears. And through a conversation with the resurrected Jesus, Peter finds strength. And the same is true for us. When Jesus was burnt out, can can I tell you? I believe Jesus was burnt out in the garden. He was out of gas. He was saying, God, I can't. I mean, he's praying so intently not to go to the cross that his sweat's turning to blood. And and he said, God, don't please. I mean, if it's your will, I understand and I'm going to do it. He still had the right frame of mind, but he was burnt out. He said, I don't want to do this. I can't do this. And so God sent him angels to give him strength in the midst of his moment. It's always through relationship with God that we find strength to push forward. And, and, And so what do we do? Number one, if you're hurting and you say, I quit, then you need to renew your mind. You need to go home and you need to find 10 minutes of quiet time to spend with God. You need to go home and and open up your Bible and start to read. But what do I read? If you don't know, start with the Psalms. You've got to get into the Word. You can't keep making excuses to say, well, I don't understand Scripture. Because that's a good excuse, by the way. Some Scriptures are super hard to understand. And even even me, your minister, (laughs) it, it can be hard. And there's things I don't understand either, but there's strength in the pages. Even sometimes when you don't understand what you're reading, there's strength to be had. There's strength through prayer in a relationship with Jesus. There's something real called the peace that passes understanding. And I'm a believer in it. But you only find it through relationship with Jesus. You don't find it in a bottle. You don't find it in all those other ways. You find it in Jesus. So go to him. Renew your mind. Also, how do you want to, or how can we continue to persevere when we're burnt out? We need to learn the difference between a stitch and a cramp. Renew your mind and then learn the difference between a stitch and a cramp because I think that's really important. How many runners do we have in here? Any runners? Okay. You, yeah, that's right, Ryan. That's right. Yeah. By the way, I don't know if you've met Ryan, our intern. Ryan, stand on up for us. Let's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody, this is Ryan. He's our summer intern. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. We love you, Ryan. We love you. Yeah. And by the way, he's a runner. And, and don't let him fool you because it's like what? Uh, yeah, I'm not going to embarrass him. Never mind. He runs a lot. He's like Forrest Gump. And... Uh, <laughs> And say, yeah, no, seriously. Like, I got up here and I just saw him running laps around the church just for fun. And and he was out there for like four hours in like 90 degrees. No, I'm kidding. I made that up. It's not true. That was a lie. Uh, But no, no, no. Anyway, so when you're running, Ryan, you know this. There's a difference between a stitch and a cramp in there. And, and, And stitches are something you can push through. They both hurt. If you've never experienced what I'm talking about before, let me explain to you. You ever had a cramp? We all had a cramp before. And and a cramp can get so bad that it will put you on the ground if you keep trying to go through it. There's moments where, look, I remember when I was playing football. This just popped into my head. Sorry, I'm I'm chasing squirrels right now. And uh, (laughs) and, 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 and I'm playing football, and I, I was the running back. I was like 120 pounds soaking wet, so my goal was to hide behind my linebackers. And so I'm, I'm, Playing and we've been playing and it's only the second beginning of the second quarter. We hadn't been out there very long. My legs are cramped, both of them, and, and I'm going. All right, I'm going to push through. And so I, I, I took, you know, I'm like limping back to the huddle, but I'm trying to act like I'm still good because I was like, oh, I'm going to push through this. 
And I, I learned that day, you can't push through cramps. The next play, they hand me the ball, and I instantly take one step, and I just fall on the ground. And I just have to hold the ball and wait for the play to be dead. And my coach has to take me out, and they made me drink really hot pickle juice from the concession stand to try to help me. It didn't help, by the way. I don't know. They say it does, and I'm sure you're right, but it didn't help me. It was just disgusting, and I drank like two big cups of that stuff. I still hate pickles to this day. <laughs> And every, side note, every time I go to the movie theater, I'm sitting next to the person that's going to eat the pickle. If you're the pickle eater, don't sit by me. I, they stink. I don't like them. I, I, I think it's back to the football days. And, and, and so, but when you have cramps and you try to push through them, you're not going to make it. They're going to put you on the ground. But a stitch, they hurt. Now, if you've ever been running, you know what that is. And man, it just, it gets in there and it just hurts. And, and, and they can feel like they're going to put you on the ground. But the key to, to a stitch See, a key to the cramp is to stop. A key to the stitch is to keep going and to push through and train your body to handle these things, to push through. I mean, if you want to run a marathon, you want to run a lot, you're going to have to face the stitches of life and keep running. In life, listen, we're going to face cramps and we're going to face stitches and we're going to have to learn the difference between each. And I don't know how to tell you the difference. It depends on the scenario. But if you pray and have a relationship with God and you're renewing your mind like we talked about, He will reveal to you when this is a stitch or when this is a cramp because there's things in life that you're going to face where you have to, as Exodus 14, 14 says, be still and let the Lord fight for you because this is a cramp and I can't make it through this. But then there's times in life where God's going to motivate you and say, keep going, I press on. And those are the stitches of your spiritual life. And you've got to learn to identify them. And the only way to identify them is to go back to where we were earlier. Renew your mind. It's the relationship with Jesus that will help you to identify what you're feeling and what you can and can't do. And so this lesson, yeah, it's to encourage you. You're going to face those cramps and those burnout moments where you can't do it. Your encouragement this morning, you need to be still and let God fight. You need to build your relationship with him. For those of you who are facing the stitches and you say, I'm feeling like I can't do this anymore and it hurts so bad, my encouragement is to keep going. And how are you going to do that? It's the same answer. It's through the relationship with Jesus. We find strength there for both stitches and cramps. We find healing in the presence of God to keep going. I'm wearing a shirt. I don't know if you've seen. It's not just because I wanted to do some kind of weird attire this morning, but it actually has a purpose to it. This shirt, I don't know if y'all can read it, but it says persevere across the front. It's got that really awesome scripture that says, you know, uh, be strong and courageous and do not be afraid. Uh, from Joshua. And so it's a really cool shirt, but it's got an awesome story behind it. Uh, we've got some, we call them, you've got your family and you've got your friends, right? But then you've got what I call your family. And it's your friend family. And I think everybody's got those friends that are so close to you, they feel like family. And that's whose shirt this is. That's where this shirt comes from. It's a part of our family. And Avery has grown up with the family. It was some friends of ours from Louisiana. And they all went to church together. And they've grown up together. And they've loved each other. And they have family get-togethers. They have family Christmas parties. We have a family texting group. And even though we're still here in Texas and they're in Louisiana, we'll text each other all the time on the family group. And, and Tammy, one of our friends, one of our family, um, was diagnosed with cancer. And so it was a really tough time for the whole group, and, and obviously for her. And so her daughter came out with these shirts, and of all the words that the family could have used to help her to make it through, the word they chose was persevere. The word they chose was persevere, keep going. We're going to fight this together. We're going to persevere together. On the back, if I were to show you the rest of the shirt, it's full of scripture. It's full of lyrics from worship songs that they love. And, and they intentionally surrounded their perseverance with a relationship with God. Because that's how we make it through. And now, after many, many months and, and a long time of, of chemo treatments and fighting, she's, her cancer is in remission. And so praise God for that. It's a wonderful outcome to this story. But the way they made it through the dark, because let me tell you something, when you hear the, C, the scary C word in your life and you hear that somebody close to you or yourself or a family member has cancer, it, can be, it is one of the scariest things you'll ever face. It's tough. It's scary. It, 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 you're, you're, you begin to, to be drained emotionally and physically. It's not just a, a battle for your body. It's a battle of the mind. It's a battle of the emotions. And you can hit a point where you just get drained and you get burnt out. 
And that's why that one word they chose was persevere. Make, just keep going. Keep praying. And surround that all over the shirt with a relationship with God. Because that's how we're going to make it through. And so they did. They, this wasn't just on a t-shirt, man. That's the, that's the family lifestyle that we have. They pray. They worship. They love God. And I encourage you, if you don't have friends like that, you need to find friends like that. You know, that's what the church is all about, right? It's church family together. So are you hurting? Are you tired? Are you ready to say, I quit? Then I hope you found something in this lesson that will help you to find the strength to keep going through building your relationship with Jesus. When you leave here, you need to go home and you need to open up your word. You need to find your prayer closet. If if you walk out of here and say, that was a good message, but you leave and you're still burnt out and you're still crying yourself to sleep and you're still miserable and you're still going and trying to fill the void with other things other than Jesus, then you've missed the point of the lesson. Go home and build your relationship with the Almighty and find strength there. I believe just like he sent angels to Elijah, just like he sent angels to Jesus, he will send his angels to you to give you strength beyond your understanding. I want to leave you with one verse, and I want you to let this be your verse when you're going through hardship and and struggle. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is Paul once again, and he says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but we're not destroyed. I I love that scripture. Let that be your verse when you're facing burnout and you feel like you can't keep going. Man, you may be beaten down. You may be hurting, but you're going to keep pressing on and straining towards that goal through perseverance with a relationship with Jesus. I love you, church. If there's anything we can do for you, uh, we have an opportunity for you to respond. So once you do that now, as together we stand and sing.